Welcome to my Christmas special 2021, part 2. The detailed preparation of a Christmas dinner showing simple and compound vegetables, featuring a coffee machine and Skyrim. I'm going to start with the Brussels sprouts. And according to Google, they're called Brussels sprouts because people in Brussels like eating them. Normally, I would buy them in a pack from the supermarket, but this year I thought, just for a change, I would buy them still attached to the plant. The first part of the operation, which is different to buying them in a pack, is you have to cut them off the stalks. But then it's pretty much the same. You cut the bottom bit off and remove the outer leaves, which are usually damaged or dirty. I always cut a cross like this in the bottom of every Brussels sprout. I got this idea from my grandmother. I used to watch her doing it many, many years ago. By doing this, they do seem to cook a little bit better. You have to be careful, though, that you don't cut your fingers. There's a distinct technique where you press your thumb at the side of the sprout, which stops the knife from travelling too far. In no time at all, the first four of the sprouts were in the pan. Quite a few to go yet. Here's the same principle one more time. Cut the bottom off the sprout, remove the damaged leaves and cut a cross in it. For these jobs, it's really important to have a carrier bag hung on a chair next to you. And that way you can keep the surface that you're working on clear of debris. Time to cut off a few more sprouts. I don't think I like doing this. But after a while, I did realise that they felt slightly different to the ones in packets. I wasn't very happy about the amount of waste though. The sprouts near the bottom of the stalks were damaged and the ones at the top were too small. I'll see whether the taste and texture of the end result justifies the means. The next vegetable to process is broccoli, one of my favourites. These are like small trees, so you cut the stalk off them and carefully remove the individual florets, just trimming them to how you want them to look. I still have my carrier bag on the chair at the side of me, so any substandard florets are thrown into that, but most of these are going into the pan. I bought plenty of broccoli, so I can afford to throw away the smaller pieces. Here's a shot of the carrier bag that I dumped the rubbish in. In the pan now, I just have one piece of broccoli. Time to dismember the second one. When I was a schoolboy, I wanted to be a doctor or a surgeon. And all these years later, I still enjoy cutting things up. Thinking about it though now, many years later, I'm glad that my life went the way it did. Getting into music put paid to the idea of being a surgeon. I got a job as an electronics engineer apprentice, which I did for a very short while. And I spent quite a lot of time when I was a professional musician, repairing Hammond organs. But then in 1984, I opened my recording studio. And now the pan of broccoli is ready for some water. I eat quite a lot of cauliflower as well as broccoli. And the process I use for cutting vegetables is possibly not the best way you've ever seen it done. With a cauliflower, I cut the bottom off. And then using this long thin knife, which I can actually curve, I cut the centre out of the cauliflower. A quick word of caution, when using knives for cutting vegetables, or whatever you use knives for, always keep your hand behind the cutting edge, never in front of it. That way, you're less likely to inadvertently commit suicide. I continue the job using a similar process, getting rid of the piece of stalk in the centre. And then, similar to the way I process the broccoli, I just cut off the individual florets and trim off any more excess stalk that I don't want. The question at this point is, do I enjoy this? Well, no, not really. I find it fairly boring. But as I live by myself, it's the only option. If I want to eat or make food for other people, I have to prepare it. My second wife and I got a divorce when I was 66 years old. It was either that or the acid bath. And to be honest, I didn't mind the food part of it because I was doing all the cooking anyway. In my opinion, my second wife's cooking was terrible. She was once cooking a Christmas dinner and took the turkey out of the oven to baste it and it fell out of the tray and slid across the kitchen floor. And when she prepared spaghetti, many a time she would actually accidentally, when draining the spaghetti, tip it into the sink, then pick it all out and put it on the plates. She once cooked some spaghetti so badly that a dog that we used to have refused to eat the leftovers, that's how bad it was. If you weren't careful, it would actually stick your teeth together. These are not purposely bad comments. These are all 100% true. When my wife and I divorced, the main thing I was worried about was using the washing machine. Because over the years, she used to go on and on about how difficult it was to wash the clothes. 
All I did was read the manual, put the clothes in, put the washing powder in and press the button. How difficult can that be? Anyway, the pan of cauliflower is complete and filled with water along with the broccoli and the Brussels sprouts. Please try to contain your excitement while I show how I prepare green beans and peas. These packs of beans are from a local supplier. I don't just chop them up, I always remove the end bits because I don't like those. The process is as follows. Get a handful of beans and cut the ends off one end, rotate them and cut the ends off the other end, chop what is left in half and put them in the pan. Quite a while back I made a video and I was showing cutting vegetables very similar to this. And one YouTube viewer was very strange about this and sent a comment in saying, you shouldn't do it like this, it's going to blunt your knife. Here's the bottom line, this knife is about 20 years old. The blade is still plenty sharp enough, the problem with it is, the handle's going a bit funny. It's coated in rubber and the rubber's breaking up. Now I have a pan which is half full approximately of green beans. Please don't turn off just yet, because I need to add the peas. These are frozen peas that I've just taken out of my freezer. I'm stirring them about a bit, just to show you that the beans are still in there. This may seem a bit odd, mixing fresh beans with frozen peas. But it's still early afternoon, I've added the water to the pan, and in no time at all, the peas will thaw out. And when it's finally time to turn on the heat, the peas and beans will all cook from the same ambient temperature. This is a vegetable that I don't cook very much. It's cabbage. I'm not quite sure about the best way to do it. My logic tells me to treat it like a large Brussels sprout, but in reverse, cut the bottom off and remove the leaves. Discard any dirty or damaged leaves. And once you get through to the good leaves, you just chop them into strips and put them in the pan. As I was doing this, it occurred to me that if I was making a video of a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream, I could accessorise the players with these cabbage leaves. I'll show you what I mean. You see, it makes quite a good hat, and it gives me like a, a fairy look, a 20-stone bearded fairy, and alternatively, as the world is still in a pandemic, wearing another cabbage leaf could be an improvised mask, provided that you use your glasses to clamp it in position. This is an ideal solution for actors on stage in a live production of A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare during a global pandemic. In the end, I abandoned this idea and threw them in my plastic carrier bag. With the inner leaves that were very clean, I just cut them into strips. After a while, though, I did try a different technique. This seemed to work quite well, so I could cut more than one leaf at a time. And finally, I had a pan full of cabbage. I don't think I've ever had cabbage with Christmas dinner before, but I thought, just for a change, I'll try it. And here's a pan full of cabbage, ready to add the water, ready to cook. In the world of steam engines, there are simple engines and compound engines. And also, in the world of vegetables, there are simple vegetables, like some girlfriends I've had in the past, and then compound vegetables like these, which need peeling before you can chop them up. So, I'll start with the carrots. Here, I'm peeling a carrot. Not everybody does this, but I think this could be something bad in the actual skin. But either way, I always peel root vegetables. And a carrot, and the parsnips you're about to see, not to mention the potatoes, well, I will be mentioning the potatoes, because some potatoes are a bit different. Don't worry, I'm not going to show the peeling of very many of these carrots. After peeling the first carrot, I put all the peelings that I removed into my plastic carrier bag which I've emptied three times so far. This part of the job is quite important. When cutting the pieces of carrot, try and cut them to all the same thickness, because if you have thin ones, and thicker ones in the same pan, cooking for the same amount of time, you can cook the carrots for an amount of time that makes the carrots consistency to how you want it, but if you have thin pieces in there, they will become mushy. The amount of time that you cook vegetables is down to the individual. My preference is that the vegetables are not crunchy, as in the al dente style, but I don't like them mushy either. My grandmother used to do most of the cooking in our house when I was growing up, and she always added something called sodium bicarbonate to the water in which she cooked the vegetables. And also, in my opinion, the vegetables were overcooked, but I am, after all, the product of a different generation. 
To be honest, my grandmother's Christmas dinners were a wonder to behold. And as for the bicarbonate of soda, as it was called, I don't know whether that affected her, but she did die when she was 89. I think I'm in need of a cup of coffee with my new coffee machine. I've warmed the cup and placed the cartridge in. I've pressed the button and the coffee is now pouring into the cup from the machine. I often wondered what was in these cartridges and it's actually ground coffee. I took a used one apart to have a look at it and they're made from aluminium, not plastic, so that's a good thing. This is the milk frother in operation. Altogether, I think this is a really well designed machine. You press another button on the top and the milk is lifted out of the container, frothed and poured into the cup. And here's the clever part. Then the machine starts up again and pumps some more coffee liquid into the mixture to sort of stir it up. And the coffee's really nice. The only trouble was that this particular day for me started early and during the day I had three cups of coffee this size. And when the family arrived, they all laughed at me and said, Dad, are you on drugs or something? This was, of course, later in the day because it's only 5 to 12. And by this time, I'd only had two cups of coffee. Here's the quantity of food prepared so far. There's still a little way to go. I'll do that in the next and final episode. I took my cup of coffee and went into the lounge, turned on the TV. Then I selected HDMI 4, which is the game input for my Xbox. And here is the game Skyrim. And I'm currently on level 92. Normally I play this game in first person, but I thought I'd show you the character that I'm playing. Skyrim is a really good computer game. You can wander around a beautiful landscape, picking flowers, collecting things. You can get married, you can adopt children, but most of it is mass murder on a large scale. An ideal thing to do before preparing the potatoes. Once again, to avoid comments from the more critical viewers, here is a steam engine. I've made it look a bit cartoon-like to fit in with the computer game. And that's it for this episode. Stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it interesting so far. Please take the time to visit my main Steam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.